What's going on everybody? If you're new to this channel, my name is Quentin Stuckey, otherwise known as Stux. I make videos to do with personal development, narrative, psychology, philosophy, among tons of other topics. Please subscribe to my channel and be sure to like this video. So today we're at episode number four of Story Structures, and today we're talking about one of my all-time, if not probably my all-time favorite gothic story. We're talking about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I really like this edition that I have because the cover of it looks like the sort of diagram that you would have seen in the uh, Enlightenment era when they were first beginning uh, scientific experimentation and they were learning more about biology and the human body. Um, many of the conclusions that people came to back then uh, were wrong, um, especially when it came to the ingredients that made up a human being. I mean, that's a whole, a whole nother video, but I really enjoy uh, this cover design and I believe it's by, it's designed by Andy Carpenter and Leah Lococo. So good job to them. Done a really good job. Before we begin though, I of course have to acknowledge where I'm getting my information from. So all of the diagrams that I'm working from originally came from an article written by Gavin McMahon, and I'll put a link to that article in the description box. And Gavin took these seven basic story structures from the book, The Seven Basic Plots, written by Christopher Booker. Frankenstein. I actually have read this book uh, twice in my life, and the first time that I read it, I actually wasn't a big fan of it. It's not at all what you expect. First of all, we should make it clear that Frankenstein is not the monster. Frankenstein is the scientist that creates the monster. Frankenstein's monster is just called Frankenstein's monster or called the creature. In the book, he's called the creature. It's a big point of confusion that people still mix up today, even though the story has been countlessly adapted and reimagined and there's been so many sequels to the universal horror films. There's been Frankenstein hammer horror films. Frankenstein is so, so embedded in our culture. I mean, it really is, I would say, one of our uh, modern myths. In fact, the subtitle of the original edition of the book was called The Modern Prometheus. And for those that aren't familiar with the myth of Prometheus, Prometheus was um, someone who took fire and brought it back to the gods. So he discovered some grand technology and brought it back to his community. He essentially stole fire. I believe that that's the myth. Someone correct me if I'm wrong about that, but he, he was the one that discovered fire. And that relates to the character of Victor Frankenstein, the scientist in the novel. And he goes further than anyone has ever gone in terms of scientific experimentation. But Frankenstein's crucial error is that he performs this scientific experiment, creating another human being out of these inanimate um, body parts. He conducts this experiment without any sense of morality, and morality is, an, very, is a very important part of scientific inquiry. I mean, morality is just a very important part of life to begin with, so. When I read the book a second time for uh, a gothic literature class that I actually took just this past semester, unfortunately it was cut a little short by the COVID-19 pandemic, so the rest of it was conducted online but I really enjoyed the way that my professor talked about Frankenstein in relation to the other Gothic texts that we were reading. And I ended up writing my essay on the portrayal of male-on-male -male friendship in Frankenstein, because one of the, th one of the theorists that uh, our professor referenced, and I can't remember exactly who the theorist was, but they had stipulated that Frankenstein is really um, three guys getting together, getting together in a bar and expressing their deepest desires, their deepest fears, their sadness. Um, because the first portion of the book actually is from the perspective of an Arctic explorer called Robert Walton, and he discovers Victor Frankenstein out on the snow. He brings Victor Frankenstein aboard, and then the remainder of the book is told from Victor Frankenstein's perspective. And then about three chapters of the book are told from the creature's perspective, Frankenstein's monster's perspective. So you have three different narrators in Mary Shelley's text. And what's interesting is that they all sound the same. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I didn't enjoy the book when I first read it on my own. Because, you know, when you have three different narrators in a book, you want to differentiate them somehow. Because otherwise it just sounds like it's the same person talking throughout the whole text. But of course it's not. 
you know, like if you're writing a book, there is usually subtle changes in tone, in word choice, um, when a different narrator is speaking, you know, you need, some, again, you need something to differentiate all these narrators. Mary Shelley's writing style doesn't really do that. There was a, another edition published in 1831 that included some edits made by her husband, Percy Shelley, who was a, another famous writer of the 19th century. Uh, he was uh, particularly associated with the Romantics movement. And even this book is uh, closely associated with Romanticism. At my university, uh, Ryerson, the novel is not only taught in Gothic literature, but it's also taught in a Romantics course because there are these long descriptions of nature and the book broadly is about that tension between romanticism and scientific progress. Um, these kind of grand emotional states versus um, degrees of rationality because Victor Frankenstein creates his creature um, out of a rational mindset and not out of a moral or emotional mindset and he certainly pays the price for that. It's lasted all these years because it's a gothic story that is incredibly philosophical and it really lends itself to constant rereadings and you know to this day the conflict between say more humanistic values of the importance of individual life and the um, importance of individual responsibility versus the excesses of technology and the availability of technology that we see nowadays i mean most of you are probably watching this video either on a desktop or even on your TV or on your phone. So where is the line between um, individualism, again, more humanistic values, and technology? Because, you know, some people argue that the more we progress, the more we progress from a technological standpoint, the more we lose sight of what really makes us human, and the more we're likely to make decisions based off of technological progress or just based off of progress in general rather than consider the uh, humanistic implications of the advances that we're trying to make. So I think that that's really what this book is about. For our purposes, we're going to be focusing on Frankenstein in relation to the plot structure of overcoming the monster, because this book does fit in very neatly with that plot structure, but not in a happy way, I would say. So it fits in very succinctly, but it's not a very happy story. It's not your traditional overcoming the monster. Some monsters are overcome in the novel and some monsters aren't overcome. And in fact, uh, one of the other thematic elements of the book is who is more of a monster? Is it Victor Frankenstein or is it the creature, the monster? So the first point in overcoming the monster plot structure is peace and calm. This can be seen right in the beginning of the novel. Right in the beginning, we're in the perspective of Robert Walton, who is this Arctic explorer. He's writing letters to his sister talking about how he is enjoying his expedition and he can't wait to discover worlds that humans have never seen. But at the same time, Robert is lamenting the fact of how lonely he is. He desperately wishes for a companion. He wishes to have someone there, um, in his words, to correct his errors, to make uh, judgments, to make counter judgments about his expedition. That's one of the beautiful things about uh, relationships, or one of the most useful things about relationships, is that when you have someone there to uh, challenge you to see what you're doing from an alternative perspective, that can make what you're doing a lot better. You know, that's why we, we need people because we we're actually quite limited in our um, in our perspective. You know, we're quite blinded sometimes by the uh, by principles of uh, rationality and we can't always see our problems very clearly unless someone else comes along from an outside perspective and says well this is the situation before you here's what we can do about it so that's what Walton is really wishing for so he does feel this this sense of um, ambition and confidence in what he's doing um, but he is feeling rather lonely he's feeling rather lonely on the expedition even with a whole crew of men he doesn't feel like he can really uh, be intimate with uh, any of those crew members, so he's really wishing that he had a friend there. And there is this sense of peace and calm, like it's like there's no, there's no particular conflict established. The first couple chapters are just these letters of Walton describing his experience. So there is this kind of like calm before the storm, if you will. The second point in the overcoming the monster plot structure is a sudden conflict. So one day Walton notices a man on a sled being pulled by these dogs 
and he decides to bring him aboard, and it turns out to be Victor Frankenstein. And Victor Frankenstein then goes on to uh, recount his tale to Robert Walton, and that's really when the actual story begins. The first couple chapters, you could say they're just a prologue, and now the actual story begins. So Victor Frankenstein begins to talk about how he was uh, pursuing uh, uh, principles of natural philosophy when he was in university. He came from this uh, quite affluent family, and he was a very intelligent, very curious type of person. He cared more about his academics than he did about his actual relationships, and so that was really important to him. And his professors began to get nervous about his ideas. And one particular idea that he pursues is the idea that he can create life from inanimate body parts. So Victor sets out to do this experiment on a dark and stormy night. He creates his creature. Um, he calls it, uh, throughout, the, throughout the novel, he calls it a companion. He calls it a double. Um, it's kind of implied that he is trying to create a being that is very similar to him. He's almost trying to create a friend for himself, a twin, which is something that I drew upon more in my essay. So he creates this monster and he is, he is so frightened by its appearance. It has these yellow eyes, it has this pale skin. Um, it obviously, obviously looks quite deformed because it's made from dead body parts. He's so frightened by the appearance of his creation and also so frightened by the fact that he was actually able to do it that he runs away from it. He runs away and he's bedridden for weeks and weeks and weeks. He completely just abandons his creation and he goes off the face of the earth basically for a little while. Like he's not in commission. So that's where we have Victor's sudden conflict because he realizes that, oh my god, I can actually do this. I can actually create life. And I've created life that is ugly, that is monstrous looking. And this is another theme that's, that's in the book, is the idea of monstrosity. Victor is, a, is averted from his creation, not because the creation is a monster on a, on a personal level, but because the creation looks like a monster. So it's Victor essentially judging a book by its cover. And because Victor abandons his creation, the creature is basically left to be on his own essentially, to learn about human life, to try and organize his identity around uh, his first experiences, which entailed his creator or his parent, his father, completely just abandoning him. I mean, can you imagine if uh, if uh, you had a child and you were so repulsed by that child that you completely avoided it? Imagine what kind of an impact that would have on the child. Obviously, it would have a terrible impact. And that's exactly what, what Victor does. And so, the creature, in a way, is trying to get Victor's attention. He stumbles upon Victor's relatives, so he kills William, and worse than that, uh, Justine is blamed for the death of William, because Justine, uh, Victor's family's nanny, essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe she's, she's their nanny, she is blamed for the crime because she was the one that was last seen with William, and Justine ends up getting executed for the crime, and Victor doesn't say anything because he doesn't think that that anyone will believe him when he tells them that I created this monster and it's killed William. It's it's responsible for the death of William. So Victor just stays silent and he sits through the trial of Justine. Like there's a long, a long uh, scene where Justine is put on trial and she's found guilty and she's executed for it. And Victor still says nothing. I mean, it's like, it's it's insane. You can understand Victor's position, but at the same time, you know, someone that you've known all your life is being implicated in the death of one of your relatives and you're going to stand back and not say anything like it's 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 crazy it's troubling so one by one more of victor victor's relatives are killed by the monster his father's killed his fiance elizabeth is killed his friend henry is eventually killed so all of these deaths are a result of victor's abandoning of his creation the third point in the overcoming the monster plot structure entails the hero traveling far so at one point to escape the presence of the monster, because the monster keeps popping up in various locations, um, trying to talk to Victor, and Victor's obviously aware that the monster is responsible for the deaths of these loved ones. He decides to take a trip with his friend Henry Clerval, and they travel to all these uh, uh, beautiful sites across Europe. They, 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 they see mountains, they go on hikes. Um, it's a chance for Victor to relax and get away from it all. 
and yet the creature still keeps popping up in these uh, random locales. I, I remember there's one scene where he's on top of a mountain and he's uh, um, looking out over the view and he spots the creature in the corner just kind of standing there and like and uh, you know wanting to talk to him and he's always saying vile wretch get away like he's obviously very uh, very fearful of the monster and he's uh, you know he's not averse to telling the monster what he what he thinks of him I mean he refers to him all the time as a wretch a creature filth a monster like all these derogatory terms and the monster uh, goes up to Victor and says to him that you know you're my creator like like tell me what I am all I want is your uh, attention and the monster recounts to Victor um, what happened to him after Victor ran out of the lab so the monster stumbled upon this family he tried to form relationships with this family but he wasn't able to because of his monstrous appearance and the monster tells Victor I want you to go and create a mate for me I want you to create a female version of myself and he warns Victor that if he doesn't, he will be with him on his wedding night, which is my favorite, favorite line in the entire novel, where the monster keeps saying to Victor, I'll be with you on your wedding night, which is like just the weirdest thing that you can say to someone. And it's, and it's, and it's quite threatening. I mean, what a threat that is, because Victor is about to get married to Elizabeth. And, you know, the monster is basically saying, if you want to be left alone on your wedding night, if you basically if you don't want me to kill your fiance then you will create um a mate for me you'll create a female for me but victor doesn't decide to do this he can't really bring himself to create another being like him because victor is again so repulsed by the appearance and he doesn't like the notion of bringing another creation like that into the world especially after the deaths of so many of his relatives so he doesn't do it he he just can't bring himself to do it and the monster says okay well I'll be with you on your wedding night. You know, I told you, I, you know, I, I threatened you, so look out, essentially. The fourth point in the overcoming the monster plot structure involves the resolution of conflict. But in the case of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the conflict is not completely resolved. What ends up happening is that, obviously, Victor's fiance Elizabeth, is killed on their wedding night, Victor's father is then killed, and Victor's friend is killed. And so in response to this, Victor decides to pursue the monster and to destroy him once and for all because obviously he's caused all this damage and other people have been implicated in the crimes, including Victor. Victor's actually blamed for the death of his friend Henry Clairville um, when it's obviously the monster. So Victor ends up in the Arctic in the midst of pursuing the monster and then that's where he meets Walton and that's where the story comes full circle. He's now completed telling his tale to Walton and it's at that moment that he dies after telling his story and then the monster comes on board Walton's ship. The fifth point in the overcoming the monster plot structure is a happy ending, but it's not really a happy ending. The monster comes on board and Walton's first reaction is, vile wretch, get away. You know, he's just completely listened to, uh, to Victor's recounting of the tale. And so uh, he has this particular image of the monster because even when we hear the recount of the monster's early life from the monster himself, it's still through the voice of Victor. The, the overarching structure entails Walton, then you have Victor, and then you have Victor's recount of the monster. So it's all filtered through Walton and Victor primarily. The monster really doesn't have any sense of narrative agency. So obviously Walton is influenced by Victor's recount of the creature's recount. So he he refers to him as a vile wretch, he refers to him as a monster, all these things, all the terms that Victor was using beforehand. The creature realizes that Victor is dead and he laments the fact that his creator is dead because all the creature really truly wanted was obviously some love from Victor, some attention, like any child would from a parent, basically. And the creature disappears into the night never to be seen again after realizing that his creator has fallen dead and Walton after hearing this whole ordeal this whole mad tragic gothic story decides to turn his ship around because he realizes that like Victor he was pursuing scientific progress at all costs without any sense of morality and so he didn't want to make the same mistakes that Victor had made and he decides to turn his ship around and cancel his expedition. And that's where the novel ends. So in some ways, 
it is a cautionary tale for Robert Walton as a scientific explorer. And because of his hearing the tale, he decides to not go down that same road. It's sort of like what I was talking about in, in the episode on tragedy, where tragedies are useful because we can learn from other people's mistakes. And that's exactly what Walton does. He learns from the tragedy he's just heard, and he's able to overcome the monster within himself. Because the real monster in this book is not the creature. It's not even, I wouldn't even say it's Victor Frankenstein. The real monster is scientific progress without morality. That is the true monster. If Victor had decided to show his creature some love, if he had taken responsibility for his actions, things could have been totally, totally different. Because Walton has gained that knowledge, it's implied that maybe he'll pass that knowledge along to others, and other people will make the same mistakes that Victor Frankenstein made with his monster. Applying this plot structure to everyday life, we're in the midst of a pandemic right now, and the COVID-19 virus could be construed as a monster that we have to overcome. And overcoming the monster is a difficult task, and it's not done as neatly and nicely as it is in books. But nonetheless, we can certainly learn something from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in that progress is only a good quality if it's balanced with a sense of morality. Reason is only as good as emotions, and emotions are only as good as reason. So I think that the book sticks around again because of this theme. It's a tension that we see played out continuously in society and as I said especially now with the COVID-19 pandemic it is a monster that we have to overcome but we can't overcome that monster at the expense of other people's well-being and that's really important because Victor and his pursuit of scientific progress, scientific experimentation, scientific reason, he inadvertently caused the deaths of people that were most important to him. If Victor had humanized his creation, if he didn't see it as just a ugly, vile creature that he gave life through these scientific principles, then the story could have turned out completely differently. I mean, who knows what might have happened. But of course, Victor has, in a sense, overcome the monster because He's told his tale, he's warned someone else about what he's done, and he dies. So he escapes the monstrosity that he's experienced in his life, but that monstrosity is a result of, again, scientific progress over a sense of morality. I really recommend the book for those that are interested in gothic literature, and even those that are just generally interested in um, romantic philosophy, anyone that's really interested in books in general. Anyone that's really interested in, in human nature should read this book. So what I'm basically saying is that everybody should read it. That's really what I'm saying. That's all the time we have for today. If you're new to this channel, please hit the like button and subscribe. And if you feel the need to do so, the Patreon link is linked below. Any amount helps. The money that I get from Patreon, I can bring on higher profile guests. I can purchase better equipment. I can dive deeper into the topics that I want to research. And... I'm a Brooke University student, so you'd be helping me out a lot. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.